She's been shot at by a crazed high school psycho whose only mission in life was to murder her. Another teenager wanted her dead for the only reason that he wanted to be famous. But perhaps the most astounding assassination attempt was when a mystery figure tried to derail her train, a plot that was subsequently covered up by the government. The way old Lizzie has survived three assassination attempts will blow your mind. We're going to start with the most recent assassination attempt on Queen Elizabeth. The year was 1981, and she was in New Zealand, fulfilling her duties as a traveling monarch. The perpetrator of the crime? A 17-year-old kid named Christopher John Lewis. You might wonder why a teen would want to blast the queen to kingdom come, but you only need to look at his background to understand that his proverbial screw was loose. According to news reports, this boy lived in a house with a tyrannical father. Life was so chaotic for the kid that he couldn't even read or write until he was 8 years old. After assaulting another kid, he was expelled from school. He cut the heads off birds. His favorite man in the world was none other than Charles Manson. He got into petty crime while he was still young, culminating with his gang taking just over $5,000 from a post office after holding two workers at gunpoint. That was a lot of cash in the 70s, especially for a teenager. But for Lewis, the thrill from the violence was more important than the money. But he didn't stop there. He and his mates put together what they called a guerrilla army. They gave the outfit the name the National Imperial Guerrilla Army, spelling guerrilla wrong. With Lewis at the helm, they terrorized the neighborhood. Those that were close to him knew him as a bona fide psycho. As an adult, he wouldn't disagree. We know that from his memoirs, aptly titled Last Words. It was during these tumultuous years that he concocted a plan to do something to the queen that would put his name in the history books. He later said that living with his father was a living hell, which rendered him feeling in a constant state of terror. It's hard to say why he wanted to go as far as killing the queen, but he blamed what he called the twist wreckage of his life and the fact that he very dearly wanted to become an outlaw. He was close to it already, feared in his town for many reasons, such as when he held up an elderly woman in her car and demanded a ride. And so on October 14, 1981, this troubled boy decided that he would take out his problems on the British monarch. At the time, she was visiting a museum in Dunedin, the town where Lewis lived. That day, he hid his 22 caliber rifle, stolen earlier from a gun shop, in a pair of old jeans and walked into a seven-story building from where he'd set up his shot. His getaway vehicle a 10-speed bicycle, he left outside the building. Inside, he sneaked into a toilet cubicle and unwrapped his gun. He was seething with anger when he put on his gloves and readied the rifle. The queen he knew would soon pass by in the street in her Rolls Royce. As the motorcade got closer, his hands trembled as he heard the cheers of the many people in the street. He stood up by the window and waited, his gun pointing toward the road. Suddenly, a loud crack was heard by many people in the crowd. The queen had just stepped out of her car. She wasn't hurt. The shot wasn't very close. If Lewis actually meant to kill her is not certain. He later said he didn't actually want her dead, stating, I felt that giving her a scare somehow, that the issues and problems that were evident in New Zealand might finally be brought into the public attention, and as a bonus, if the Queen would look at these issues, she might well take notice. That's not what the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service said after he'd been picked up by cops eight days later. They believed that this kid had tried and failed. All this was actually a hush-hush and led to a cover-up because it wasn't a good look for New Zealand. But this cover-up doesn't even come close to what you'll see later. When he was charged, all the public heard was that his crime was illegally possessing a firearm and illegally discharging one, not that he had tried to kill the queen. As we said, people in the crowd that day had heard gunshots, but cops later assured them and some curious journalists that it was nothing but an unrelated racket. When Lewis heard the charges in court, his words were, only two charges? What? Had the bullet hit her, would it be treason? But the whole the story remained classified until February 2018 when a media company found out the truth. By this time, Lewis was long since dead. His death is a grim story if there ever was one. After the incident, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. There, he once pulled a knife on a guard, and in his spare time, he concocted another plan to take out Prince Charles. After his release, he wrote these memoirs, and while he did try to stay away from crime, intelligence services never let him out of their sights. They thought he was still dangerous, knowing that if he had a more powerful gun that day, he could well have killed the Queen. That's why in 1995, when the Queen was visiting New Zealand again, they exiled him to Great Barrier Island for an expenses-paid 14-day vacation. As a friend of his once said, he always wanted to know what it would be like to take someone's life. The next year, Lewis was accused of doing just that after a mother of three named Tanya Ferlin was found dead in her house, her head smashed by a hammer. Lewis was accused of the murder and of kidnapping her child in an effort to secure a ransom, but the evidence against him was weak to say the least. Cops had listened to an informant, a friend of Lewis's, and he told them that 
that Lewis had killed the woman. From his jail cell, Lewis wrote, I stand firm in my convictions that the present nightmare will soon be over. I know in my heart that I didn't commit these crimes, so this is all the hope I need for myself. It's very likely he wasn't guilty, and the culprit was probably that informant, a man who later committed a similar murder. But Lewis didn't get to clear his name. He was electrocuted in his prison cell before his case went to trial. What's amazing about that story is the fact that Lewis really could have killed the queen. There's no doubt about it. It's also fascinating that no one but the royals and some chosen authorities knew about it. With this next young chap, his assassination attempt was never going to hurt the Queen much, but it was spectacular in itself. It happened again in the same year on June 13, 1981. This time the Queen was on home turf, and again, her would-be assassin was just 17 years old. His name was Marcus Sargent. On the day he managed to get off six bullets as the Queen was riding a horse through central London for what's called the Trooping the Color Ceremony. That day, the crowds filled the street as the soon-to-be-married Diana Spencer rode in a carriage with Prince Andrew. Her lover and future husband, Prince Charles, like the queen, rode on horseback. Sargent didn't have anything near the psychological problems that our first assassin had. He was a boy scout who'd done pretty well in school, and as a youth he'd won awards for marksmanship at the Air Training Corps, a kind of cadet school for young folks. But then at the age of 16, things started to go wrong for him. He joined the British Royal Marines but left after a few months for what he later said was bullying. He then joined the army and only managed to get through two days of induction. To add to this list of failures, he was also turned down by the police and the fire brigade. Angry and disappointed in himself, he ended up working at a zoo. At age 17, he was out of work again, and he'd taken upon himself to become a member of an anti-royalist group. Things could have really gone badly for the Queen if this young lad hadn't failed in finding ammunition for his pop's 455 Webley revolver. He tried in vain to get his hands on another gun, but as you know, it's not easy in England. Even though Sargent joined a gun club to get himself a license, it seems he gave up on trying to buy a real gun and instead paid about 80 bucks for two blank firing replica Colt Python revolvers that were sent to him via mail. If he couldn't kill her, he was damn well gonna scare her. Not long before he did the deed, he actually sent a letter to Buckingham Palace stating, Your Majesty, don't go on the trooping color ceremony because there is an assassin set up to kill you waiting just outside the palace. The letter arrived three days after the ceremony. As she rode on her horse, Sargent seemed to appear from nowhere and fired off six shots. Needless to say, this shocked and scared onlookers. No bullets came out of the gun, of course, but the noise frightened the queen's horse, named Burmese, and it reared up a little. Like a champ, she steadied the beast. Guardsmen and cops were on Sargent like a flash, and the queen, according to one of her bodyguards, rode on as cool as a cucumber. He told the press she looked shaken by the episode but soon recovered her composure. Sargent was charged with the 1848 Treason Act and sentenced to five years in prison. It turned out that this failure of a kid had been obsessed with the assassinations of John Lennon and John F. Kennedy. When investigators unearthed his diary, one of the entries read, I'm going to stun and mystify the whole world with nothing more than a gun. I will become the most famous teenager in the world. He didn't deny it later, telling the cops to their face, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a somebody. Psychiatrists didn't think he had any kind of severe mental health issues, saying he was merely a messed up, insecure kid who'd studied the Lennon assassination and couldn't believe how easy it had been. He thought, why not? I would like to be the first one to take a pot shot at the Queen. He was released from prison at the age of 20, and due to him being disliked by a lot of royal loving Brits, he gave himself a new identity. All the time he'd been locked up, he apparently sent letters to the Queen apologizing for what he'd done. She didn't reply once. We can't tell you what happened in the end to this boy that was called by the media a traitor and a fantasy assassin, but we reckon he sure would have been looked on with interest had the truth about the Queen's later visit to New Zealand had been told. And that brings us to another cover-up, easily the strangest tale of the three assassination attempts. Like the New Zealand attempt on her life, the story only became public knowledge many years after the event. In 1970, she was on a royal tour of Australia. On the 29th of April, she was riding a train with her husband, Prince Philip, heading from Sydney to the city of Orange, a distance of about 161 miles. The incident happened close to the town of Lithgow, population of 13,000. We now know that prior to her boarding that train, someone had laid down a large log on the tracks. At around 7 feet long and about 8 inches in diameter, it was big enough to derail the train. Someone had obviously left it there in the dark and they'd wedged it in enough so that it would do some serious damage. In fact, the train did hit that log and was momentarily shaken. But it just happened that at the moment, the train had been going much slower than usual. Had it been traveling at the usual speed, there is every chance it could have derailed and the Queen been seriously injured or killed. A report written many years 
Pierce later said the train continued on brakes for about 200 meters with the logs still wedged under the front wheels before finally coming to a halt at the level crossing near Bowenfell Station. As things turned out, the Queen didn't know a thing about it. The Australian cops didn't report the matter, and a local newspaper that knew what had happened made a so-called gentleman's agreement with the cops not to publish the story and so embarrass them and the country. The newspaper, the Lithgow Mercury, kept hold of the story for close to 40 years. One of the investigators later admitted he pulled the editor to the side and told him not to publish the story. He said, I took him for a drive and I told him the story and I said, I want your assurance that you don't print it. And he didn't print it. In 2009, it was finally published. For many years, Australian cops investigated the plot, but nothing came of it. One of the reasons for that was because they couldn't actually talk to many people about what had happened. The lead investigator recalled, We never came up with any decent suspects because if we interviewed people, we seemed to be talking in riddles. Who is behind the plot remains a mystery, with IRA sympathizers being high on the list of suspects. Still, it could have been another kid trying to make a name for himself or just a regular run-of-the-mill loon. It seems Buckingham Palace had also been kept in the dark all those years, although it's possible the British authorities also kept the story under wraps. In 2009, the palace issued a statement saying it didn't want to comment on the matter, but in the royal diary there was no mention of anything strange happening on the train that day. Now you need to see how the Queen lives in an average day in the life of Queen Elizabeth II. Or get some insider secrets with the weird secret rules the royal family has to follow.